Hey everyone, I am here with Dr. Yoram Solomon. We just recorded a couple great episodes of the podcast and we're having a conversation, a casual conversation. I was just telling him why I do this segment. And of course, the reason is because I, from doing a lot of podcasts in the past, I mean, I, up to this point, you know, just in the podcast that I host today, I have well over 700 episodes that have been published, over 100 more that have been recorded. I have did radio before this. So I've done over a thousand interviews um, over the past few years. And one of the things that I noticed from doing so many podcast interviews is that people show up, we'll have a great conversation, then we'll hit the record button and they tend to put on their podcast voice, which is fine. They still give great information, but it's that, you know, people are watching type of deal. Then the record button's done. We hang out for 10 or 15 minutes afterwards and they exhale, become themselves again. And it's really good stuff that we talk about. And I inevitably end up thinking as we leave, I wish that was the podcast because that was the best stuff. And now it's gone forever. So I started hitting the record button to do these videos and I was explaining this to Dr. Yurm and it triggered a great story. So I wanted to give context so he could tell that story. So it's all yours. Yes. Th thank you, Mario. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the funny. So uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the time that I spend when I talk about trust is I talk about intimacy. And to me, intimacy is, you know, there, there are different levels for intimacy. It starts at the bottom with just words, you know, when you send words uh, through text or email or anything, and then, uh, the level above that is voice, hearing my tone of voice, and how consistent that is with my um, uh, with my words. And then at the the highest level, it's the um, uh, it's it's the facial expressions and overall body language that really complements and either supports what the words that you use, which builds trust, or it contradicts with it, which kills trust. And uh, <laughs> one of the stories that. Uh, that I typically tell my audiences is uh, I'm a pilot and uh, I took friends uh, flying. And one day, one of my friends, as, as we were taxiing to the runway, uh, one of my friends said, uh, hey, when are you going to start using your pilot's voice? I'm like, what pilot voice? I don't have a pilot voice. And he said, uh, no, 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 you, you used that pilot voice before. And I'm, I have no clue what he's talking about. And so I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about, but you know, and, and I'm talking to all of them, you know, my usual, my regular voice, which you're hearing now. And I said, listen, uh, I'm, I'm about to talk to the tower to ask uh, permission to get on the runway. We can get on the runway. Since we're all in the same uh, intercom system, don't speak right now. Let me be the only person speaking because they're going to hear everything here. Okay. So are we all good? I, I, can I talk to the tower and they will give me the th thumbs up. And as soon as they gave me the thumbs up, I go, uh, Reed Hillview tower, Cherokee three, zero, one, six, Tango is uh, ready to go at three, one, right. And that's what I realized. I have a pilot's voice. And I did change my voice when, uh, when I was talking to the tower. And, and, you know, I started thinking, why did I do that? Well, why did I change my voice? And, and the thing is that I wanted to convey something. I wanted to convey something to the tower. And that is, I'm the pilot here. I am in command of the airplane. I know exactly what I'm doing. Let's keep uh, our roles to ourselves and let's do the right thing here. And you have to convey this, uh, this uh uh, confidence, if, if you will. And so what I realized is that, yeah, a lot of people do that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something. My, my wife told me not to say this on air, and uh, you're probably worried right now. And that is what my attitude is November Oscar Bravo Sierra. And if you think about what November Oscar Bravo Sierra is, it's no BS. That's my attitude is don't, don't BS, you know, be yourself. If you want to build trust, you be yourself. You say what you mean, you mean what you say, and you're not mean when you say it. Uh, and, and it's been a big part of my life, I think, uh, ever since I, I did serve in the Israeli Defense Forces, that, you know, don't pretend to be somebody you're not. You know, be who you are. And I love that story that you just told, because I think it just made me have an aha moment in my mind of why I, I noticed that so much in the podcast voice. And it's because... When I first started in radio, I never really had the radio voice, right? I just did my thing. And when you, if you go back, my first podcast episode I ever did was in 2000, it was in February of 2011. 
and it's still online. You have to dig to find it, but it's still there. And I leave it there for a reason because I like to go back and hear the difference between that and where I am today. And I do that because I don't want people to get discouraged. Clients that I work with, I don't want them to be discouraged if they haven't found their voice yet, because that is something that happens. But finding your voice is different than putting on a voice. And so the one story I remember is when, you know, I, I was walking the puppy around the, uh, around the complex one day and this new neighbor came up and he was walking his dog, an older gentleman. And we started having a conversation and I could tell from being in radio, I could tell right away. And I just asked him, I said, what station do you work with? And he said, how do you know? And he worked with the one that was down the street, which is um, a CBS affiliate. And I said, because you have the voice. And he's like, well, after 40 years, which is how long he's been in the business, you just can't turn it off. And it's not that you don't turn it off. It's just that's what your voice is. That's what it becomes. So when you hear people who are on the radio who are, have been on for a long time, they don't have a radio voice that they turn on and off. That's just how they sound now. Now, it may have modified it from being on the radio because, as you said, you have to project, you know, you have to enunciate differently, project, but it becomes who you are. And that's why it's authentic and people connect to it. And it's the same thing. If I have a conversation with you pre-interview and then we get on the line, this is how I always talk and this is who I am. And I think that helps because I think a lot of new podcasters will get into the space and they do the same thing. When record is hit, they'll be talking to you like this or whatever, and that's their cadence and their tone and all that. And then they hit record and they're like, okay, and now it's time for the show. And you're like, well, who is this? And then you put up that wall. Yeah. So I think that, that that authenticity is super critical. And, and it's more than authenticity. I think it's to some extent, it's vulnerability. And, and by the way, vulnerability helps build trust, um, your willingness to be vulnerable. So to me, when you interview me, and by the way, just for the record, you do sound the same and you look the same before you hit the record and after you hit the record button. So for your audience, he's telling the truth. Trust him. Thank you. Thank but, you. <laughs> but um, to me, it's when I share something with my audience, it's not, I don't take the attitude of, uh, okay, I'm the expert here. Uh, let's, let's put things in perspective. I've been researching this for three full years or, or 10 years or whatever uh, I'm talking about. But uh, when I shared with the audience is, hey, you wanna hear something cool that, that I found? I did this research and this is what I found. And, and this is me, this, this is what I feel when I find those cool things. And this is who I want to convey when I talk to my audiences. Yeah, and that, that enthusiasm and passion just shines through. And I think that, yeah, that's super important. And I think that, you know, for people who are listening to or watching this or listening, however you're consuming this, if you are a host of some sort or you are a facilitator or you just want to have better conversations with people, you know, you should definitely check out Dr. Yoram's The Book of Trust because trust is a huge, huge factor in that. That being able to, and I think there's something there's something to, and I'd love to get your take on this be as the expert that you are in trust. There's something to, if you show up as who you authentically are and show up as yourself and have that vulnerability, as you said, you don't have to say it to someone else. They'll see it, they'll feel it, but that in and of itself gives them permission to do the same. And I noticed yeah. that time and time again. It, it definitely is. And, and you know, there are three components, three, three behaviors that, uh, and I'm not talking about the seven laws of trust or how trust behave. I'm talking about people, how they behave. Every company, the people when I interviewed uh, that were in an innovative, creative, productive, effective environment, the three behaviors that you saw that led to this uh, ability and willingness to hold a constructive disagreement were vulnerability. This is, I'm going to ask stupid questions and, and that's fine. You know, I'm, I trust you not to take those questions and, you know, tell other people, which is something that happens a lot in, especially in large organizations. Hey, do you know what Mario said in, in that conversation? This is the stupidest thing I ever heard. Uh, no, I, I, I don't, I trust you. So I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to ask stupid questions and I'm going to suggest stupid ideas. The second part of it is I'm going to be giving you feedback, direct feedback, unsweetened, unfiltered feedback, uh, not because I want to put you down, but because I want you to be better. And, and I want to tell you what I think, and I'm going to tell it to you to your face and not behind your back because that's not effective. And the third one is I'm going to be receptive to that feedback coming from you. I'm going to trust you that the reason you're giving me this feedback is because you have my best interests in mind and not because you want to hurt me or, you know, emotionally, physically, or any other way. Yeah. 
that's that's great stuff. I love how you take these things and break them into like numerical steps because you're you think mathematically and for those people watching the equation i just want to point out behind you isn't just a fancy background you can buy from a stock photo image that's your actual mathematical model for trust well actually you can buy this uh, on amazon because it is part of my book and so these are real you know i i, I go and i talk to uh, i give large audience seminars and, and workshops and, and keynotes and I tell them about my model of trust and I put this slide up there and, and the audience starts laughing. It's like, oh, that's, uh, really, that's, no, seriously. I mean, this is, this is what I've been working on for the last three years. This is the model that I developed to how trust gets developed, to how you become trustworthy. But I never go into the details of it. In, although Appendix A in the Book of Trust does include the formula and explains how I got there. How long did that take you to, to is it, was it three years of off and on just going in and testing things and trying things and doing equations? No, actually, I started this morning. I, I needed to have a backdrop <laughs> at the backdrop. You're fast. No, I, <laughs> no it, uh, in, in my book, Culture Starts With You, Not Your Boss, which is an interesting book by itself, uh, it has nine fictional stories that are based on true events. And I took part in eight of them, except you would not know which character I am in those books. And that book, right, uh, and I think I mentioned that story in, in one of the uh, podcasts that, uh, that you recorded, um, that after the book was already edited, and this is 2017, after the book was already edited, I, I started realizing that the foundation for everything is trust. And so I wrote this one short chapter, I think it had some like three, four, maybe five pages, um, and so this is the only chapter in the book that's not edited because I edited it after it was already edited as a book. Um, and I just started saying, you know, there are six components to being trustworthy. And here are the six. And that was the first time that I showed the relationship between them, which was nothing like this. And as I kept on investigating and researching trust, I found that it is more complex. So, you know, like right now, if you look behind me here, this is the time element, how time plays a role. Uh, you know, the importance of the first 15 seconds versus the first hour or the first year of a relationship, the intimacy, uh, positivity. So for example, did you realize that we respond three times stronger to something negative than to something positive, which by the way, would explain everything that you read in the media. I mean, the media can sell you on, oh, something nice just found. Somebody just recovered from uh, the virus. No, somebody just got the virus. Somebody just died from the virus. That sells more because we are three times more likely to have a reaction to something negative than to something positive. And so what you see right behind me and that, that part here, that's that. That's that part. That's our reaction, our stronger reaction to a negative thing that happens between us. And right over my ear or behind my ear, you know, there's intimacy, which I talked about, you know, the words, the tone of voice and, and your overall nonverbal communications. But some people are better in conveying this. Some people are better in perceiving it. So that has to play a role. So that's, it took three, three years of looking at the formula, trying to balance it against um, what I see happening in reality and saying, you know what, I think the formula needs to be modified a little. That's interesting. What, do you remember the exact moment when, because I know there was a whole story, we talked about this on the podcast, when you, uh, when you found or you got to trust and you figured it out. But do you remember the exact moment when you were like, this is trust. Now I'm going to dedicate my life to trust. Do you remember that moment? I do. I do. Um, it was... I was meeting with a client and this is the time. So when I started my organization, I started it, it was actually a different name. And, and in 2015, I changed the name to the Innovation Culture Institute because I realized that I'm going to be focused on innovation culture. And uh, this company invited me to do a workshop for them on innovation culture. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be the type of person that comes in and does something even if you don't need it. So I'm starting to ask questions. And the more questions I ask, the more I realize that you don't have an innovation culture problem. I mean, yes, you do have an innovation culture problem, but there is something that's underlying there. And, and I remember 
kind of vaguely, probably not in exactly those same words, saying something like, you know, in, in this organization actually quoted to me this, this large consulting firm that gave them this framework to work on. And I said, look, this is, I'm not going to say anything bad about that framework. This is a great framework, but it's like starting to build your building from the second floor. And it's not going to stand if you're starting to build from the second floor. And innovation culture is going to be building the first floor, but even that's not enough because you're lacking the foundation. And we need to work on the foundation, and the foundation is trust. Because for the last 20 minutes, all you've been telling me are really why you don't have trust. So I'm not saying innovation culture is not important, but you can't build it if you don't have trust first. It's not going to hold. It's not going to stand. And so you, you had that conversation and you realized that. Were, do you remember like a time after that, like thinking about it and going, they have this trust problem. I bet other companies or other people have this as well. I need to learn more about trust. Was there excitement there? Was there... Uh, some type, what was the, what was the emotion like when you find, because I know that as an entrepreneur, one of the most difficult things to do, and it's something that we work with clients all the time is getting clarity on what is your thing. And I have actually, my fourth book that I'm writing right now is all about that. It's called what's your cheesecake, by the way, but it's, and so, cause I use the story from the cheesecake factory to, to convey that, but it's like, what is your thing? What is that one thing that you're known for that you like pursue that you dedicate yourself to and build everything else around. And when you come up with that, when it finally hits you and you know, and you have that moment of clarity, to me, it's, it was like a euphoric moment. Did you have something similar to that when you were like he, sitting he was. after that conversation? It was, and it was after that conversation. That conversation did take place in 2017, right as Culture Starts With You, Not Your Boss was being edited. That conversation was the reason why I added that tiny short chapter. You know, <clears throat> there is another moment that, that I remember when, when I took flying lessons, when all of a sudden it hit me that you keep altitude, not with the stick, you keep altitude with the throttle, with how much you of of gas you you inject into the engine i remember that was that to me was it's like it didn't make sense all my understanding of uh, aerodynamics it didn't make sense it made sense that you go up or down with the stick not with the throttle and you actually go up and down with the throttle so i remember that being a moment that conversation with the client after 20 minutes when i realized i don't want to offer them working on innovation culture i don't want to i want to help them build trust I need to really understand how to build trust. And, and I remember I, this was, I spent days and nights. I mean, I barely slept in trying to figure out that three, four, five page chapter in Culture Starts With You, the chapter that talks about trust. Th there was nights of no sleep in, in just figuring out what is trust and, and reading everything that there was to read about trust and all the different concepts and, how did other people look at trust and, and going, but wait, this model doesn't explain it. Most of the models that talked about trust were, were relating to trust as something that is universal. You know, Mario, you can be more trusted than, uh, than or, or th there's a certain level of trust to you. And, you know, I, I, I got it. If, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share it with you another story. So I teach, you mentioned that uh, when, in, when we recorded uh, the, uh, the podcast, you mentioned that I'm a professor, uh, which I am. And uh, one day, so my daughters, I have two daughters in college and, and they, uh, they registered to a class. And when they registered to that class, they checked their professors on a website called Rate My Professors, which I never knew that something like that had existed. So it's like people posting their, their uh, reviews of professors. And so I asked her, how, how do I know if I have a page? And, we went on, on there and sure enough, we found that I had a page. So since then, I know that I have a page. And then one day I was teaching a class and this is a class, a class that I taught uh, late last year. And then afterwards, you know, every now and then I would go to rate my professors and see if anybody posted. And you don't know who posted it. And I want to read to you uh, one of the reviews that I had. So I pulled it on my, my left screen here while, uh, while we were talking. So here is the, the review. Okay, first of all, in terms of uh, number of points out of five, with one being the minimum, I got a one. And it says that I'm awful. 
Okay, so awful professor, one out of five, with one being minimum. And here's what it says. Uh, this course was mostly about his own accomplishments rather than a broader view of peer-reviewed techniques of uh, success. He uses his own self-published works as material and so on. And I'm like, wow, this is terrible. I'm a terrible professor. And then I look at the next one, okay? Here's the next one. Now I'm getting five out of five. The word is not awful anymore. Now it's awesome. Still starts with an AW. You probably want to start them in different letters. Um, but it says this, Professor Solomon is awesome. I really enjoyed his class and lectures. If you're interested in starting a business, this class is a great intro as it focuses specifically on building out a business plan. He gives good feedback in his lecture supply and so on. Now, here's the interesting thing. Both students sat at the same class at the same time. We're not talking different semester, we're not talking different classes, we're not talking different times, different classrooms. Those two students sat at the same class at the same time and took the same class with me. How can they have such different perspectives on the same thing, on the same thing? And this is where I realized that unlike any other uh, attitude towards trust or, or model of trust, trust is not universal. It is not absolute. It is relative. You may trust me and not trust somebody that looks just like me. Um, you may trust me with one thing and not with another. You may trust me at some level and not with another level. Trust is relative. And so it's at that time when I realized that all the existing models of trust really don't satisfy me. They, they don't answer, they, they don't account for what I'm seeing when I'm meeting with people and I'm asking them questions. And, and that's when I said, okay, I guess I'm going to develop my own. That's great. And so, yeah, I, I definitely trust you as far as being a professor in entrepreneurship and mathematics. I don't trust you in brain surgery because you told me not to. So I trust your judgment. How do you know? How do you, <laughs> okay. I got to tell you another story, another short story. So we're done with, so I told you that my daughters are in college. So yeah. let's take my younger daughter, Shira. She's nine years old at the time when I get my doctoral degree. We, we come home from uh, my, my graduation ceremony and Shira had a friend over for a play date. And Shira asked, uh, or her friend asked Shira, uh, Shira, what, uh, where have you been? Where, where are you coming from? And Shira said, oh, we just came back from uh, my daddy's doctoral graduation ceremony. So her friend goes, oh, really? So your daddy's a doctor? And Shira thought about this for a second and she said, yeah, but not the useful kind. So <laughs> <laughs> nine-year-olds, what can you do? So I stopped giving her an allowance. But uh, anyway, this is, this is what happens when you get kids. So get, get ready. When you get kids, uh, that's, uh, they're going to say everything. But uh, the point is, yeah, don't trust me with brain surgery. That's, I mean, it's only your last choice, really, if everybody <laughs> else dies. <laughs> and the only reason I mentioned that is because you mentioned that on the podcast when we were talking yeah. about trust. So I just wanted to be clear on that. But Dr. Yorb, thank you so much for being here and sharing everything you did on the podcast. I can't wait for people to hear that if they haven't yet. And uh, for this, this casual conversation, I love the, the laid back, relaxed approach and the conversation that we had. I want to remind people they can visit you at trust21000.com is where they can find you and grab a copy of your book, The Book of Trust. It's available there and on Amazon. And thanks so much. Let's definitely talk again soon. Thank you, Mario. I really, really enjoyed it. Trust me. <laughs>